Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War Two TV and the second of today's double bill. And you know what? We haven't done a tank show for a long time, so we are doing a tank show. Pete, otherwise known as Rivets and Pins, on social media is back to talk about an influential British tank that wasn't really used much by the British, putting that much in their caveat because, of course, they played around with it. But I'm going to bring Pete in now. Good evening, Pete. How are you today? Yeah, not too bad, thank you. So... You know, you, you you cover all sorts of armoured projects and vehicles. And, you know, when you came to me with this idea, and we'll talk about what, you know, the, the, the actual show in a minute, but what, what, why, why did you plump for this one? There's, there are lots of armoured vehicles you could have been talking about. It was just the fact that I feel this is a really influential vehicle, but it's really under, well, not underrated, but it's really not that well known. Um, it's certainly not one of the big hitters, a Churchill or a T-34, but um, there's enough uh, influence exercise, right. you know, built out by this vehicle, which I think is worth covering. Well, that's a brilliant way of de describing it. So we'll bring up your PowerPoint and we'll, we'll, we'll start going. And folks, um, kind of, we'll try and deal with questions as we go along. But if you've seen Pete before, you know that it probably will be covered. If your question is coming into your mind, leave it a couple of sentences or slides. It probably will come up. But we, we of course, we welcome your comments. But um, but over to Pete. Let's talk about the Vickers Marquee. Okay. So uh, let's see if I can get this working. So there we go. Excellent. Right. So kind of what I was saying a couple of minutes ago, that... Um, when we think of World War II, we think of tanks, we tend to think of the big hitters, the big names, things like the, you know, the Churchill, the Sherman, the T-34, Tiger tank. But all of these tanks had or tended to have much more humble beginnings um, before they got to the position where they became a, a, a very useful or feared weapon. Right. And talking of humble beginnings, this is one of those humble beginnings, the Vickers Mark E. Uh, now, we might look at it today and think it looks a bit like a sardine cannon tracks, but there's, uh, uh, there's a lot more going for it than you might think, just looking at that photo. So what I'm going to talk about tonight, obviously, I'll give a bit of background. Um, so I'll start off by going back to 1916 when the tank first arrived, the advent of the medium tank talk about when Vickers joins the uh, the game and then the Vickers marquee itself what was the tank what was it what what drove its sales success why did what did it become that successful vehicle and then look at the legacy as well because it also had a rather large influence on tank design around the world despite the fact very few people tend to uh, have heard of it so Going back in time, 15th September 1916, Battle of Flair Corselet, the first British tanks on the battlefield. And these are large, slow machines. They're effectively assault guns. Um, you wouldn't look at that and call it a tank in the, as, as we would understand the word tank today, with a turret and a gun, etc. But these are big, slow machines to assault the, the German trenches, take out the strong points which are holding up the infantry and allow an offensive to, to move forward. Obviously, the idea being to try and break out of this static trench warfare, which has been ongoing for the best part of two years. But as the tanks run in, literally as, as they're going in, the, the high commander are talking to Sir William Tritton, the man behind Fosters of Lincoln, who came up with the idea of, of these particular machines. And they're saying, well, these are great. Looks like they're going to do the job. But once we break through, you know, we need something faster, lighter, that's going to get us to Berlin quickly, you know, get the bat battles moving again. So literally in the autumn of 1916, Tritton goes away, tries to come up with some ideas as to how he's going to put this into practice. And what he comes up with is a tank that people may well have heard of, the Whippet. Mm. or as it was officially known, the medium Mark A. So it's smaller than the big lumbering Mark IVs and Mark Vs that are out on the battlefield uh, when this arrives at the end of 1917. Um, as you can see there, it's half the weight of a big Mark IV tank. And obviously weighing less, it's able to go faster. In fact, it can go twice as fast as a Mark IV. 
which is sounds impressive, but when you appreciate that a Mark IV is only four miles an hour on a on a good road, and the Whippet can go eight, it's a step in the right direction, but mm. only a step in the right direction. It needs to go a few more steps. Um, the right hand photograph I've included. Uh, it's a Russian. If you've got keen eyes, you'll see the Russian script on the on the side of the tank. It's a Russian Whippet. And I've included that so you can get an idea of the size of the thing. Even though it's a medium tank and supposed to be smaller and faster, it's still a whopping great big lump of iron. Anyway, as I mentioned, this goes into service at the tail end of 1917 and is used throughout 1918, during which time they're working on replacements for this already. Uh, the shape tends to go back to that sort of big block rhomboid type shape of, of the initial uh, tanks the British used. But they come up with a, a Mark B, a Mark C, and a Mark D. Now, they produce, they actually go into production with the Mark C and the Mark D and, and produce some, but they're too late for the end of the war. But they do go into service with the British Army. Now, so those are the medium tanks which are, are happening. And within a couple of years, 1921, a certain company called Vickers of Sheffield, a, a known arms manufacturer, enters the tank building uh, industry. They come up with a couple of designs. They, they build a prototype of the Vickers number one tank, and it kind of looks like one of those medium mark C's with a, a upside down frying pan on top as a turret. Not particularly successful. So they come up with this design, which is a lot more successful, the Vickers Medium Mark I. And as it happens, it appears 100 years ago this month. Hmm. Now, again, you look at that and you can be forgiven for thinking, yes, it is a sardine can on tracks. But I would actually argue this is a very significant vehicle. It's the first vehicle that, or the first tank that goes into production uh, in Britain with a completely revolving turret. And it's actually got the class, the three classic parts of a tank. You've got a lower hull with the tracks on it, the, the chassis. You've got a suspend, uh, get, get him my words mixed up here, a superstructure on top, which houses the secondary armament, the machine guns. And then on top of the superstructure, you've got the turrets. You've got, this is the first, if you like, British tank in inverted commas. And just a quick, quick question, Pete. Was were Vickers developing this with um, feedback as they go along from the British Army, or is it kind of an in-house um, kind of design that they're thinking about what they believe as a company warfare needs? What I mean, for the most part, they are responding to requests and specifications from the right. War Office, but Vickers do seem to have had a bit of leeway in interpreting those specifications. And um, we'll see that in a, a, in a few slides time, ironically enough. Okay, thanks. So, uh, yeah, Mark I. Um, with hindsight, you compare that to a Cromwell or, or a Comet from 1945, and that does look a bit basic. It's a generation or two in tank design mm. behind. But, as I say, it's this is the first time... The British tank has, has got a superstructure and have got a turret. And the tracks don't go all of the way around the hull like they do with the very first tanks. So for a first production vehicle, and they build 58 of these, it's not a bad little machine. I mentioned the turret. It's a three-man turret as well, something which tends to get forgotten in later designs. A three-man turret is actually quite significant because that allows uh if you like a nice logical split of duties and responsibilities within the tank so you've got a commander who can focus only on commanding his crew liaising with tanks in the same or another unit um you've got a gunner who concentrates on uh, aiming and firing the gun and you've got a loader who loads the gun you haven't got for example like you get in some of the 1930s french tanks a commander who's doing all three of those roles. Mm. So you've got a good split of responsibilities already in the, in this turret. Um, you've got a three-pounder gun there. You've got a machine gun in the turret and three in the hull. So it's nicely armed. It can move at 15 miles an hour. 
uh, which is almost twice what a whippet could uh, move at, um, only a few years previously. Weighs 12 tons, two tons uh, fewer than the whippet, and you've got five crew. So on the whole, it's not, as, as a first stab at a production tank, this is pretty good. Yeah. Obviously not perfect. Um, one of the lessons that was learned, certainly by the French, uh, by the end of the uh, First World War, is that you keep the engine out of the crew compartment. So when you look at the Renault FT, you've got at the back, you've got the engine compartment, then you've got the crew compartment. So you keep those apart and the crew doesn't get so much noise, doesn't get so much heat, uh, doesn't get so many poisonous fumes coming off the engine. This lesson wasn't really incorporated in this tank. You've got the engine at the front, you've got the gearbox in the middle, but the final drives, the final gears that actually turn the sprocket wheels at the back, um, which make the tracks go around, are at the back. So the powertrain goes all of the way through the tank, which is a rather curious design. Um, the other weakness is it's only got six millimetres, just over six millimetres of armour, which is really the same as the, the Mark IV back in 1917, sort of 17, 17, uh, 17, 18. To compound things, the fuel tanks, the petrol tanks, it's not a diesel, it's a gasoline stroke petrol mm -hmm. engine, are in the crew compartment. So once you get a machine gun bullet passing through that very thin armour, it could quite easily set light to the fuel. And if you're a crew member, you've suddenly got a big problem on your hands. And lastly, those tracks are rather narrow. The general principle is the wider the track, the less ground pressure you exert on the ground underneath you. So if you've got thin tracks, you're going to exert more ground pressure. And what that means is if you've got thin tracks, you exert a lot of ground pressure. Once you come off a road and you go across country, your tank will sink that little bit more into the ground. You lose speed and your steering becomes that much more difficult. So your maneuverability is, is hampered. So not a perfect tank by any means. But as I say, not bad for a first go. So after that, you'll, you won't be surprised to find out that the Vickers Mark I is followed by a Vickers Mark II. Um, looks very similar. Uh, really, the only difference, major difference, was the superstructure was, was different. Um, the only way you can really, well, there are ways you can tell the difference, but if you're so inclined to want to know your Mark 1s from your Mark 2s, if you look down just above the wheels on the Mark 1 there, you've got no armour above the wheels, but there you've got a nice big armoured plate. So that's how you tell the two. Um Hundred and hundred and something, up to 110 of Mark IIs were built, and there were Mark II, Mark II A's, all that sort of thing. But that was your basic model, and again, that goes into service alongside the Mark Ones. Um, now, talking of requests from the War Office, Vickers gets a request for a what from the War Office for a rather large, long low tank with a gun in the front and sponsons on the side like a first world war tank full of machine guns so they provide a design but they also slip in this other design along the lines of this is what you want ask for but you might like this as well mm. <clears throat> and again even though this independent tank you see in the middle doesn't go into production what it does do is end up influencing uh, various other tank designs um, because it's got some curious elements to it. You've got five turrets for a start. You've got the big marshmallow turret in the middle with the main gun, and then you've got four other smaller turrets around the side. Now, <clears throat> the, bigger turret, the bigger of the small turrets to the right that you can see on the screen was supposedly an anti-aircraft machine gun, but as David Fletcher points out, you'd be lucky to actually see an aircraft from inside that, let alone shoot it down. One of the other interesting points is there's a big rectangular hole on the side, um, which Vickers included. And the idea of that is that you can get a wounded crewman out of the tank on a stretcher without taking him out through the turret. You just open the door in the side and pass the poor guy out. Interesting. Mm. Um, now, the army likes some aspects of it. Other aspects they're not too keen on. 
the thing doesn't go into production and, and again you can see this at the tank museum at bobbington as well it's sitting in a hall uh, all, all its own at the moment but uh, quite significant because it ends up being the um if you like the trigger for a whole raft of designs with multiple turrets um one of which was the one in the bottom right hand corner the a6 series which follow on these these a6s they only built three of them and they're the prototypes for the uh, medium mark three which is supposedly coming in and as you can see you've got the stretcher hole on there you've got multiple turrets etc but they only build three of those and when they put it into production as the medium mark three they only build three of those and it's kind of at this point that vickers think well we've built a load of mark ones we've built a load of mark twos they don't want our independent and the A6 is not that great either. Um, we're not making much money out of this tank building business. So, you know, they sit down and think, well, we're plowing a lot of money into research and development and, and research and development of any new weapon system or vehicle, car, truck costs a lot of money. And you only make that money back when you start selling lots. Yeah, of, of course. So they sit down and have a bit of a think. And suddenly they realize, well, if we're not getting many orders from the British Army and they know that the military budget is coming down year after year. And of course, by the time you get to 1928, you got the Wall Street crash followed by the Great Depression. So budgets get squeezed further. They start to think about exporting tanks. Problem is that the British government doesn't really want them to start exporting the latest and greatest vehicles. Um, they don't want any state-of-the-art technology passing into the hands of countries which may later on end up being enemy countries. So an agreement is reached whereby Vickers will export tanks, but the British government will have some kind of veto or over any equipment that they think would be useful to an enemy. So Vickers start designing tanks for export. They come up with a Mark A and a Mark B, I know this is getting all very confusing with all these different marks, but they use numbers for British Army tanks, Mark One, Mark Two, and they use letters for um, export vehicles. Right. Okay. So the Mark A and the Mark B don't come off the drawing board. They're they're not any good. They come up with a Mark C and they actually build a Mark C, and that's it. There. There's a great big lump of iron. Quite quite interesting. Um, they build one and they sell that one to Japan. They don't build any more though. Um, but this is actually quite an interesting tank on its own because it ends up influencing virtually the whole Japanese tank program of the 1930s and 40s. It looks incredibly familiar. Yeah. Yes. I mean, you look at that and then you look at the bottom right left hand corner, the Type 89, and the Type 89 is effectively just a ripoff of the Mark C. Um, but that's not the only thing that the Japanese get from having this Mark C. Uh, when Vickers ship it over to Japan, they send over a small team of engineers, obviously to show the Japanese how to work it, how it functions, how to fix it, how to maintain it, etc. And as they're demonstrating it to the Japanese, uh, something goes wrong, apparently an, an engine misfire or whatever. And that causes... Uh, the petrol vapor, in, which is accumulated inside the tank, to suddenly uh, ignite, burning one of the Vickers engineers. Now, the Japanese look at this poor sod and think, can't really have that happening to our tank force. Um, so they embark on a program of uh, building diesel engines for all of their tanks. And that's what they do. With the exception of the Type 89, which is already in production with a petrol engine, but I think it's the second production run they fix uh, fix that by putting diesel engines into them. So that was one uh, effect, albeit inadvertently, uh, for the Mark C. The other thing, if you look at the Mark C, there's you can see two machine guns on there, one on the side, one on the back of the turret. There's also one on the other, on the right hand side, and one at the front, basically covering the whole tank with a machine gun. The Japanese like the idea of a uh, machine gun in, in the back of the turret 
Uh, not only does it give you coverage of the back of your tank, should you get enemy infantry creeping up behind you, but they figured that if they put one in the back of the turret, they don't need to put one in the front of the turret, like most other nations end up doing. If they wanted two machine guns at the front, they just turn the turret around and hey-ho, there, you there you've got it. Not entirely sure why they would want to do that. I've not discovered the if you like the definitive reason why they did it that way around but of course one one thing is that if you don't have a machine gun on the front of the turret you can make the front of the turret narrower which presents less of a target to uh, mm, yeah. tank. and then finally the suspension was something that the japanese borrowed and put on all of their tanks in the 1930s and 40s behind that armor plate above the wheels you've got horizontal springs so that when the tank goes over a rock, the, the wheels rise up, push against the horizontal spring. When they're over the rock, the spring pull, puts the wheels back into place. And if you look at that Type 97 photo, you can see how the Japanese did that. They didn't bother putting armor plates over. They, they did away with that. It keeps the weight down. But what you can see on that Type 97 over the top of the road wheels is a long bit, looks like a long bit of scaffolding. And that is a... a uh, a tube with two springs in, one at the front, one at the back, just to keep the road wheels under control. Right, okay. If you, if you look at any photograph of Japanese tanks from the 30s and 40s, almost certainly you'll spot that tube there. So, one single tank built, exported to Japan, and it becomes a real, um, a really important factor in Japanese tank production. So a question on that, Pete, um, which is an interesting one. I, I don't know whether you'll know the answer or not, but Michael is saying, did Vickers have legal recourse for the theft of their intellectual designs? Because I've never thought about that. I mean, you yeah. know, if you, what's your, what's your response? Have you got one? There are ways and means. Without a doubt, Vickers would have patented various aspects of the Mark C. But what you tend to find is that what the Japanese would have done, they would have copied the design, but changed it in a way that it didn't infringe the patent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll see further examples of that up further on into the presentation. Okay, another okay. quick question from Ian Carr is, um, is uh, John Carden heading up the design teams? Um, at the time of the Mark C, uh, possibly, possibly not. But we do get on to Sir John Carden. He, he does pop up. Again, okay, thanks. Well. Back to you. Thank you. Um, so, yeah. Uh, one single tank coming up with lots of ideas for the Japanese. But it wasn't just the Japanese who benefited from the Mark C. If I can press the right button. There, whoops, there we go. That same suspension was used on the Matilda II that the British used. Um if you look, you can see the big sprocket wheel at the back. You've got the small road wheels underneath. And behind the armor plates on both tanks, if you look at the bottom right-hand corner, you've got two bogies there connected to the horizontal spring units. So that's what you've got behind the armor plate on both tanks. So that was the Mark C. They built one, they sold it. So you could argue it's 100% sales success. Um, yeah. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Yeah. If, you, if you're going to paint a really positive picture on it. And they had exactly the same sales success with the Mark D that they uh, produced, which was effectively just a Mark C with a commander's cupola on top of the turret. They built one and they sold that one to the Irish Free State, who kept it uh, until about 1940 when they scrapped it. Um, so, yeah, not a particularly successful sales story so far. I'm sure you'll agree building two tanks and selling both, but with all of that R&D cost behind it. And it's probably around this time that the sales guys get hold of the design guys, sit them down and go, look, we need to talk, guys. Because somebody somewhere within Vickers must have sat down and realized that, hold on, we're trying... We're trying to sell the equivalent of Ford Mondeo to customers who only really want to buy or can afford Ford Fiestas. Because if you look around at the tanks that are being bought by nations who can't build their own, 
they're all small vehicles. Now, the most prevalent one was the Renault FT. Logically, after World War One, after France had built thousands of the things, they held on to thousands, but they still had a lot left over, which they disposed of by selling to other countries, uh, literally all over the world. Uh, the Italians who came in with, and again, this is one for the intellectual property uh, lawyers to get excited about, um, very similar design to the FT. Um, I would argue it's, again, it's a ripoff, but hey-ho. Um, the Italians began exporting their Fiat 3000. And again, it's a small tank. It's not particularly complex. It's quite easy to maintain, uh, certainly compared to, say, a British Mark IV or Mark V. Um, and because of the size, it's relatively cheap as well. And even the replacement that the French were planning for the, or tried for the Renault FT, the NC series, um, that's an NC27, uh, which was, if you like, the export version. But effectively, that's just a slightly larger Renault FT with a fancy suspension to let it go more quickly. Um, that wasn't particularly successful, but again, yet another small tank. So it becomes clear that what customers want are not these big medium tanks that Vickers have been designing. They want small, affordable, simple, easy to maintain vehicles. And it's about this time as well that we bring in Carden Lloyd, including the aforementioned John Carden. Now, Sir John Carden and Vivian Lloyd were two effectively automotive engineer types. I think Sir John Carden was more sort of self-taught more than anything. But they um, start up a company called Carden Lloyd Tractors Limited. And the aim is to produce things like you see in the picture there, the little green Carden Lloyd Mark VI. These are small armoured tract tractors uh, to carry mortars, machine guns, put them into position, fire them off, then move them off again. They're also there to tow field guns and anti-aircraft guns, etc. Um, they're not supposed to be fighting vehicles. They're supposed to be complementary. But, of course, when <clears throat> they come to start selling these things, because they're cheap, they're simple, they're armoured, they become very attractive to other countries. Mm. And, in fact, they become the basis for lots of other armoured vehicles, three of which you've got on screen there. Um, the German Panzer I uh, <clears throat> took a cardinoid suspension. They came up with a, a better version of it, and that's what you see there. They effectively used cardinoid as the model. The Italian L3 in the middle. The Italians, as you can see, that's, that's probably closer than the Panzer I to the, the cardinoid tractor you see on screen. But again, <clears throat> light, fairly cheap to make, and... When you're gunning down lots of unarmed tribesmen in in um, in Ethiopia, what is Ethiopia today, Abyssinia, it's a great little vehicle to have. The problem comes when you match it up against a proper tank, if you like, as we saw in the Spanish Civil War. Yeah, and these things are not quite as good. But to get an army up and running with armored units to build lots of these things is not a bad idea. And then finally, you've got the good old. Uh, universal carrier, bottom right, which was a direct descendant of the Carden Lloyd carriers. Which I would stake a claim, Pete, is probably one of the most successful armoured vehicles of all time. I mean, it, it does exactly what it's supposed to do very well, uh, used in all theatres. That's a massive rabbit hole we're going down, but I think much love for the universal carrier uh, in from, from my house. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, it does what it's supposed to do and a lot more. So, yeah, that's what, uh, that, if you like, is the, the influence of the Cardinal tractors. And they begin to work with Vickers, and Vickers end up buying the company. And Sir John Carden and Vivian Lloyd both joined Vickers as uh, managers. Um, can't, I can't remember Sir John's title in the end, but it, it's some kind of, sort of product director of some type or whatever. So... You've got this realisation that they need to build smaller vehicles. You've got the acquisition of Cardinal tractors. And one of the ideas that come out of Cardinal is they come up with a new suspension system, which is too big to go on one of these small carriers. 
and in, it's probably it's too big sorry too small to go on one of the big medium tanks it's really ideal for something in between so combining all of these factors Vickers end up designing with the help of Sir John Carden and Vivian Lloyd the Vickers or Vi as it was the Vickers Armstrong medium tank mark e or Vickers Armstrong six ton tank that or six tonner as it's also known I'm just going to refer to Vickers because it's nice and short and I've yeah. been getting into lots of uh, tongue tying. <clears throat> now, if you think back to those big medium tanks the, and, and the, the Mark C and the Mark D they sell to the Japanese and the Irish, this is a lot smaller. It's a much more compact design. You've got this new suspension system if you look at it, you've only got eight small road wheels uh, on two units, if you like. Quite a clever idea, because if one of those units is damaged by, say, a mine or, or shell fire, it's not too much effort to actually take that suspension unit off and replace it with another. There's no removal of armor plating. There's no fiddling around with uh, horizontal springs. It's all rather simple. It's also front wheel drive. You've got the sprocket wheel at the front this time. Um, <clears throat> the engine is laid on its side, so you've got a lower profile. Obviously, a lower profile means a smaller target. And for the first time, they're using twin turrets. Again, this is some, another Vickers trait taken from the uh, independent. But the biggest thing, certainly as regards an export tank, is it's now affordable. It's smaller. It's simple in terms of maintenance, and it's cheap. Exactly what they needed and exactly what they didn't have with the bigger tanks. Hmm. Now, <clears throat> that was 1928, first prototype, so they, they start playing around with this. Um, within two years, they come up with a, a second version, the, what is known as the Type B. So it's the Vickers Marquis Type B. This has just got a single turret. And then this one, they put a main gun, a 47 millimeter three pounder. For the first time, they actually put in what they called at the time a duplex machine gun, uh, what we would refer to as a coaxial machine gun, which is effectively a machine gun, which goes alongside the main armament. <clears throat> and this was the first time that you've actually got the machine gun on the same mount as the main gun. It goes up and down with the main gun and uses the same sights. And as the Vickers sales literature at the time said, was the effect of <clears throat> you can use the main gun to blow up a target and then quickly switch the machine gun to polish off whoever crawls out of the target. Although well, probably wasn't expressed so <clears throat> in such a bloodthirsty way. The twin turret becomes known as the Type A. And obviously, the, as I mentioned, this is the Type B, uh, a single turret. And it's offset slightly to the left, so it doesn't interfere with the driver's position. So Vickers, obviously now, you know, 1930, they start to advertise this as well. Um, the British Army obviously wants to have a look, <clears throat> and they go up to Newcastle or Newcastle, depending on your uh, preference. And Vickers are confident this compares favourably, they feel, to the existing tanks the British Army's using. Um, quick look through the numbers, it's half the weight of a medium Mark II. It can go faster, 50% faster than the Mark II. <clears throat> it's got twice as much frontal armour. You won't be putting machine gun bullets very easily through the front of the marquee. Mm. It's got enough crew and it's amply armed as well. So they're thinking that the British Army is going to love this thing. Unfortunately, because there's always an unfortunately in these stories, the British Army was unimpressed. They are used to, you know, these big Mark IIs, big Mark Threes on the way. These sort of big, substantial, me medium tanks full of machine guns and a, with a main gun on top. <clears throat> and suddenly they're presented with this tiny little half the size, half the weight um, machine, which they're being asked to believe can actually um, replace the Mark II. It seems very small to them, very lightweight. <clears throat> it's also only got one or two turrets when they're looking forward at the Mark III 
medium under under uh, development, which is going to have three turrets. And then they look at the suspension and are horrified that one, it's unarmored, two, appears too puny and too vulnerable to actually be of any worth. And it's the suspension which I, I think ends up being the you know the official reason for for actually rejecting this vehicle and not in just not interested the good news for vickers however is that the export customers are much more enthusiastic now <clears throat> they end up building 153 marquees over a period of about 10 years um and as, as you can see there are a fair few countries spread across the world who end up buying um <clears throat> now 153 doesn't sound a lot i mean if you're thinking in terms of world war ii numbers 100 what was it Fifty thousand shermans were built 57 yeah, it's getting up to sixty-eight thousand if you include all the chassis used for uh, m10s and what have you yeah exactly you know fifty-seven thousand t34s so 153 doesn't even move the needle but bearing in mind this is in the 1930s. There isn't a world war going on. Okay, you can argue, you know, it started in in China, but there's no world war actually happening at the time. You're in the middle of the Great Depression. So 153 isn't a bad number. Um, the keen, uh, those with keen ar arithmetical skills will will quickly add up that those numbers in the table don't add up to 153. The reason for that is that I think Portugal received one for trials, as did the USA <clears throat> and a couple of other countries. And a few were given over to the sales team uh, of Vickers so they could go and actually demonstrate these vehicles at military fairs and to foreign uh, military attaches. So 153 were prizes on bullseye. Is that it? did I did I see one on bullseye with Jim Burrin once back you, in the uh, you, <laughs> you may well have done. Yes. <laughs> that was an obscure joke for people who grew up in Britain in the 1980s. If you don't if you don't <laughs> get that one, I really apologize. <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah, so about about 140 or so were actually sold, uh, and the rest were, were uh, appraisal vehicles or demonstration vehicles. And we had a question from Dame of how much did they sell them for? Was it a fixed price or would they, oh. they negotiate with individual governments? How the hell did that work? Right. There was, a, they were about between 3,800 to 4,000 pounds. And it depended because one, one of the things Vickers did was to say, well, you can have whatever machine gun you like on it. You can, you can have it. If you don't want it with armament, you can have it without armament. And as we'll see, some countries said, no, we'll just take the tank. But no, no guns, please. We'll put our own on there. Um, and when we get to the case of Poland, we can see how the Poles managed to negotiate a discount too. Um, right. But yeah, it was about three thousand eight hundred to four thousand pounds per unit. And most of these, and I think probably with the exception of the Bulgarian uh, marquees, most of the marquees that were sold actually saw action. Uh, the first ones to see action were the three that Bolivia bought. Um, what happened was Bolivia gets into uh, a territorial dispute, dispute with Paraguay in 1932 over a region called the Chaco in the, between the two countries. The ball does not exactly brilliantly defined anyway, but there's a hint that there's oil there. And of course, suddenly people get interested. Bolivia, whose army is actually commanded by a German uh who fought in world war one a, a german general um they spend a lot of money with vickers on small arms uh field guns some tankettes and they buy three of these vehicles as well and these end up being used in the chaco which is not ideal tank country um and unfortunately the first one of these gets blown up gets a direct hit from a paraguayan field gun and is left in pieces and then the other two get caught out by the old trick of going down a road without any infantry, come up against a felled tree, can't move forward, and suddenly a tree's cut down behind them. <clears throat> one of the in, interestingly, Paraguay don't actually try to use these tanks. They sell one to the Spanish government during the Spanish Civil War, and they keep one for another 60 years before handing it back to Bolivia. 
Hmm. Um, you know, yeah, the, the curious tale of the three Bolivian marquees. China, with their 20, they end up using those against Japan when Japan, um, obviously, Japan has invaded China. Um, Battle of Shanghai, I think, is when they used them in 1937. And the survivors used all the way up until 1940, which is the year that Greece gets invaded by Italy, or when the Italians try to invade Greece, and Greece used theirs against the Italian invaders. And then France has a, a, a short-lived dispute with Siam, and the Siamese use their tanks against the French. Now we get on to the countries which ended up with more than the rest of the uh, the customers. Finland. As I mentioned, not everybody bought their, their tanks with the guns that the British were, or the Vickers were offering. Uh, Finland ordered 33. They specified, no guns, please. We want to put our own ones in there. Uh, whether or not they knew that the Bofors was superior to the three-pounder, uh, whether they were concerned about getting hold of ammunition, I don't know, but that's what they did. They put in a, a license-built Bofors gun. They put in one of their own machine guns, and they modified the tank so they could poke a submachine gun through the front and gun down anybody in front of them. Now, those tanks are used in the Winter War against the invading Soviets with limited success. Um, but it's in 1941 when hostilities start up again and, and the Finns try to recapture uh, territory back from the Soviets. They start to recover or start to capture Soviet tanks and recover Soviet wrecks. And what they're able to do is to replace the Bofors guns on all of their Mark E tanks with Soviet 45 millimeter guns, as well as the accompanying uh, coaxial machine gun. They make a few more changes if you look at the photograph, that's one of the uh, customized vehicles there. You've got a bustle on the back of the turret for the radio. Um, they make these changes and they call this tank the T26E. And they are used all of the way up until the end of hostilities in 1944 against the Soviet Union. Even that's not the end for them. Uh, until the end of the 1950s, they're still using these tanks to train their troops. So... Arguably, Finland got quite a lot for its money uh, with these 33 tanks. Likewise, Poland. Now, they ordered 38 of the twin turreted version, although they later rebuilt 22 of them as the single turreted version. They, they went back to Vickers and asked for 22 uh, gun turrets. They were pleased overall with the marquee, but they were they were quite critical of certain areas. They were concerned about the engines overheating. They were not impressed with the armor quality on the vehicles that they ended up receiving. And in fact, as I mentioned earlier, they actually ended up getting a discount back from Vickers to compensate for the substandard armor. Um, apparently at one point, there was a demonstration of how poor, poor the armor on certain tanks was by a Polish officer firing a, a revolver at the tank and the bullet went straight through the armor. So <clears throat> that was the discount that the, the Poles got on that. Right. But as I say, the overall design they were happy with. And what they did was to buy a license so they could build their own version of this, correcting the weaknesses as they saw. Uh, so they ended up calling this new version instead of the, a six tonner, it became the seven ton Polish tank or short seven TP. Luckily, the word for ton and Polish is begins with the same letters in both languages. <clears throat> it actually ends up being closer to nine tons because they put thicker armor on, which is going to weigh the ta uh, tank down. They put on again, like the Finns did, a Bofors gun, 37 millimeter, and they put a, in a bigger, heavier diesel engine. So <clears throat> that gets them up to about nine tons, but it's a much improved, certainly they feel it's a much improved version of the Vickers Marquee. Unfortunately, as we know, um, the Nazis invade in September 1939, and the Mark, all of the Marquees and the seven TPs go into action to try and fight their way back. And then, of course, the Soviets invade from the other side 
and we know the unfortunate result of that uh, conflict. Mm. And talking of the Soviets, they were actually the first customer of the uh, the Vickers little Vickers tank. They bought fifteen Type A's, um, and again they bought a manufacturing license because they 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 were thinking big. Like the Poles, like the Finns, they were not impressed with the British three pounder gun. They wanted something bigger and better, so they put their forty five millimeter gun on it. Um, the turret was their own design, so effectively they're only using the British hull and superstructure. And <clears throat> they go into production with this thing, which gets called T-26. They end up building 12,000 of these things, which, if you consider that they're not, uh, they're not in a war, um, certainly not a major war at the time, but they build 12,000 of these between about 1931 and 1942, um, 8,000 have got the single turret, 2,000 have got the twin turret, and there's about 2,000 other derivatives, gun tractors and the like. <clears throat> so an absolutely massive amount of these vehicles are built uh, by the Soviets. And they see action from the Spanish Civil War in 1936. And there you've got a photograph of one of those vehicles in the first ever battle at Sosenia. And it was used all of the way through to 1945 obviously a bit of a lull in the 1942 43 44 period when they're only used on very quiet fronts but <clears throat> when it comes to declaring war in japan in august 1945 um you find that the t26s are used against the japanese with success mm. as i say they're used from spain to sakhalin island and there's a picture of uh, some t26s parading after the victory in sakhalin so, 153 marquees built, about 130, 140 70Ps plus gun tractors by the Poles, 12,000 or so by the Soviets, quite a lot of tanks. But that's not the only uh, success of the marquee. because it had some of these new ideas on there, it also ends up becoming uh, an influence on various tank designs around the world. In the 1930s, you haven't got that many countries actually producing their own tanks. You've probably got all of those countries you see on the screen there, plus France, Britain, and Germany. And Germany only really starts up in the sort of mid 1930s. So this one tank, has an influence on tank designs of these five countries, as we'll see. Firstly, Czechoslovakia and Hungary. Uh, <clears throat> some people may well recognise the tank on the left. Its biggest claim to fame was as the Panzer 35T that the Germans used in Poland, France, Low Countries and Barbarossa. It was a Czech-designed tank. Uh, which the Germans acquired when they invaded the, the western half of Czechoslovakia. But if you look at that suspension, again, you've got the two suspension units, each with four road wheels. And going back to what I was saying about getting around patents, that's what Skoda did. Right. They they took the um, suspension units that Vickers had, but instead of using a leaf spring and a cantilever spring, they just used leaf springs they changed tweaked the design so much that when you compare it to the original it was a close copy but not one that infringed the patent so that's how skoda got around that um they fitted it to their lt-34 tank which was replaced by this lt-35 that the germans use but skoda keep using that design on further models that they come up with even once the germans have invaded or taken over, should I say. Um, they come up with a T21 medium tank, which is sold to the Hungarians under license as the Turan tank, which becomes the, the main medium tank for the Hungarians um, mid-war. So, and again, looking at that, you've got the same suspension unit that you've got sitting on the LC35. So well, that's Czechoslovakia and Hungary. When it comes to Italy, they end the Spanish Civil War very happy with their L3 tankettes, but 
also conscious of the fact they haven't really got any medium tanks to counter things like the T-26. So they effectively end up copying what well, probably more a T-26 rather than a marquee, although effectively they're the same machine. But you can see you've got the same layout. You've got the, the turret <clears throat> sitting on top of the superstructure, um, you've got the machine guns in the front, etc., And you've got that classic Vickers suspension as well. Mm. And just a quick question for you, uh, uh, Pete. It, it, it's, it's, the design clearly obviously had merits to therefore influence these tanks in Dragon's American Italy, but how much of it is also due to the fact that going back to that Bolivian conflict and, the, uh, and France is that they, other nations are actually seeing what it was doing in combat? Because as you've been saying, we're talking a lot about the war hasn't actually started yet. So armies are you know, parading their vehicles around in training fields and, training and, 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 and in a peacetime environment. But you really need to get lessons from how they're actually functioning in practical terms in the field, because, you know, as we talked about the Spanish Civil War show, that that learning curve there, the, the what you learn in a war far outstrips what you learn in peacetime. So, so is that fact, fact that people are actually seeing what the suspension and things is doing in a practical environment helpful as well? <clears throat> I, I, I won't say yes, they definitely learn. I've not looked into, you know, for example, what, what the Italian, where the Italian military attaches were, were prying around during the 1930s. Um, but I would say it's very likely indeed that certainly when we look at the two slides time, that becomes quite pertinent. Right. And I think generally, Pete, you're, you're, you're helping remind us again that tank development was was a you know a symbiotic experience i mean it was it, people nations were borrowing and sharing and ideas we tend to think of britain doing their designs and america doing their designs and the soviets doing their designs when clearly there's far more influence and adaptation and and copying and as you're saying they're license you know building under license that that the that the story is far more um um what's the word i'm looking for um shared than, than, than perhaps we think of it Yes, no, I'd agree with that, totally. Thanks. Well, back to you. Right, so, um, so yeah, Italy, uh, again, very close copies or replic replicating the, the features of the marquee on their medium tanks. One of my favourite little tanks, the, the Japanese Type 95. Uh, this, this one's quite curious because... It's got features that I mentioned earlier, which was were taken from the Mark C. You've got that tube in the middle, with, so you've got the horizontal suspension. Uh, the road wheels are a lot bigger, but you've still got the same type of suspension as per the Mark C. If you look at the bottom right-hand corner, you've got the rear of the turrets. You can see the, the rear machine gun port, although it's a kind of a strange 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock angle to actually fit it in the turret, this small turret. Um, so, yeah, you've got these Mark C uh, aspects to it, but the actual tank itself, the layout of the tank um, with the hull and the offset turret and the front drive sprocket are all taken from the marquee. Um, I'm not sure whether Japan actually managed to get their hands on an original marquee or whether or not they, they captured one of the Chinese versions in Manchuria or whatever. Um, but... Yeah, the Japanese Hargo is a mixture of, of, of the Mark E and the Mark C. It's an interesting mixture of, of uh, Vickers' influences there. And it's quite ironic that, you know, well, I say ironic. For me, it's interesting that this is Philippines week on World War II TV. And the Type 95 was one of the principal tanks used by the Japanese when they... they Mm. landed in the Philippines in late 1941. Um, but that was the problem with Japanese armour. When it came out, when this came out in the mid-1930s, this was a very good tank. It was, you know, reliable, decent suspension, decent engine, 37 millimeter gun, uh, two machine guns, not a bad little tank for what the Japanese wanted. The problem is that they didn't really develop anything after this in terms of light tanks and, again, medium tank development so when these things arrive in the philippines in at the end of 1941 
they're still there when the Americans turn up with M M4 Shermans. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that's your Hargo, the the, the Japanese uh, tank influenced by the Marquis. Then the USA. As I mentioned, the USA got at least one tank uh, from Vickers uh, for evaluation purposes. Now, the thing is with the Americans, uh, they'd already been working on their T-1 light tank. Um, for those who don't know, American tanks have codes like M4 Sherman, M3 Stuart. Um, the first letter indicates whether or not it's a prototype vehicle or it's a production vehicle. Um, T generally means it's a prototype. M generally means it's being produced in volumes. So the T1 starts off with rear wheel drive with the sprocket at the back driving the tracks round. They get hold of a marquee. They like what they see in terms of suspension. And by the time they get to the fourth version of, of the T1, the T1E4, they've put the sprocket at the front. They've copied those suspension units on the Vickers marquee. And that's how the T1 progresses. Now, it gets as far as the T2. They end up using the same suspension on the T2. That becomes the M2 as they start making them for real. And the M2A2 that you see above, the second iteration of the uh, second light tank, they've changed to the typical American vertical volume spring suspension, you know, those typical sort of wheels you see on the Shermans yeah, and, yeah, and the yeah. Lens. But the M2A2 has also taken another cue from the marquee. It's got twin turrets with machine guns in. So the Americans join the trend or the craze for multi-turreted tanks in the early 30s. In fact, they end up, this is the tank they've got the most of when war breaks out in Europe in September 1939, these little M2A2s. But of course, the Americans are looking at what's happening in Poland, in France, in the Low Countries, and they're realizing that actually, um, we were kind of right about what we thought about the Spanish Civil War, that tanks with just machine guns in turrets are really not the way to go. So they revert to a single turret, they put a 37 millimeter gun in, and they end up with the M2 A4, the fourth iteration of the M2, that you see in the bottom right hand corner. And those of you who know anything about American tanks will look at that and thinking that looks awfully like a Stuart. Mm. And indeed it was. From the M2, you get the M3 Stuart um, with a few modifications. And that's the tank that we know and love that appears in sort of 1941-42. So the Americans, um, okay, they adapt their own suspension to these vehicles, but they still maintain that front drive sprocket which they got from the Vickers. So all of the tanks that you see with front wheel drive, front sprockets in American uh, tank units in World War II, it's all thanks to the Vickers marquee. So USA, I'll quickly mention Germany. I've seen it written that the use of front sprockets on German tanks was also down to the marquee. I don't think that's actually the case. Um, I think there's confusion there because... The Panzer One gets its derives its suspension from uh, a Vickers Card and Lloyd tankette, but its own version of that. But the front wheel drive came along before the Vickers Marquis had it had any kind of impact. The Germans actually experimented with rear wheel drive first off, or rear sprocket drive, should I say? They found that the tracks kept slipping off, and they put that down to the fact that the sprocket was at the back. They then moved it to the front and then went from there. So Vickers Markey, in terms of influence in Germany, I'm not sure there's any evidence, certainly none that I've seen, that they're actually, um, the Germans took any real notice of the Markey. Okay. So that's the influence that this little tank has on all of the, uh, these various countries. It's just ironic that the one big country the country where this tank comes from just ignores anything to do with this little tank i think the only th 
thing, the only feature they take from it is the coaxial machine gun. But apart right. from that, there are no lessons learned from this marquee, which has all of this influence on tank design and is sold in massive or used in massive numbers in the 1930s. And that for me is, you know, that that's the big irony of, of this little tank that it's, you know, small sales volume in general, but has this big impact, but the British are just not interested. And it's a shame because, you know, it's a novel model. It's, it, it's brand new. It's, you know, it comes along, it's small, it's compact, it's cheap. It's, you know, it's not a bad little vehicle for the time. It's got all these different new features in. It's got this, you know, easy to maintain suspension. It has all this influence on tank design. <clears throat> and then, you know, it ends up being the most widely used tank design of the interwar period. Um, certainly if you ignore the Renault FT. Um, and that's where we get to my conclusion that it's the most successful British tank that the British Army never had. Never had, yeah. You might be looking at the blue asterisk and thinking, okay, what's he got a blue asterisk there for? Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a butt, isn't there? <laughs> there's, a, there's a butt coming, yes. You can see that a mile off. <clears throat> uh, the British Army never ordered any of these tanks at all. They, As I said, they were not interested. It was the wrong tank for them. However, after Operation Dynamo and after the British Army uh, leave Cherbourg and, and France's left and the British managed to come back, they realised, obviously, they'd have virtually all of their tanks in France. There's a mad scramble to try and find any kind of armoured vehicles that might help fend off the, the feared coming German invasion of Britain. So they put, start putting tanks out of museums, etc. Unfortunately uh, for the army, there are four marquees sitting up in Newcastle at the Vickers plant awaiting shipment to Siam. Um, they take the vehicles, they obviously put them into use and they end up being used as training vehicles at the end of the day. And the one you see there in the tank museum at Bovington is one of those four vehicles. So yes, the British army actually inadvertently ended up using four of these tanks. Wow. And that's it. Brilliant stuff. Well, um, I've got a couple of points I want to make that I'm going to go turn to some of the questions we got from the viewers. So the first thing I'm thinking about is, and I'm going somewhere with this. It'll sound weird, but I'm, I'm going somewhere. Is that that image we had in our classrooms when I was a kid of evolution, with the the the, the human standing up straight, then going back to the left. Of the image was the was the kind of the chimpanzee kind of creature. And we now realise that's not not how evolution works. Evolution is a tree, not linear. And I think the same now applies to tanks. Tanks. It's not like you can say the you know, this tank ev you know evolves into this tank and evolves into this tank. There's a there's a sort of a, a tree-like development where nations are taking a little bit from there and a little bit from there, and then from that a new a new species is born, so to speak. So that's that's my kind of first comment on that. Mm -hmm. um, and also the other one is more about more philosophical. What is being all philosophical in the in the old Greek, you know, um, philosophical philosophical argument about uh, Theseus' ship is that if you if you have a ship and you replace all the timbers on the ship and you replace the mast and you replace the sails, is it still the same ship? 10 years later. So at what point is the Vickers Marquis still the Marquis and does it actually transform into something else? You said yourself, you know, some of the countries, they added a different gun, they, they did things there. At what point does it not become the thing it started as? You know, that's, that, and and, I, and I'm guessing there isn't really a, an answer to that. It's sort of a, it's sort of a philosophical question in a, in a way. Indeed, I, I'd agree. You know, um, were the Soviets T-26s, were they really Marquis? Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, and as Colin says there, yes, it's the tr it's it's the old triggers broom thing, you know. Um, when does it stop being a marquee? Um, very hard to say, you know. Um, yeah, I, I certainly don't have an answer for that. Yeah, exactly. It's this, this, it's this. What I said is that evolution of thing. But we'll do a couple of um of questions. So Chris Bell is asking, what was the biggest gun used on the Vickers E? If and again, exactly. What are we talking about the Vickers E, or are we talking about something that came from it, like the T twenty six? But he says he does say six tons. So you said there was a forty five millimeter. Is that the biggest thing that was ever put on it? I'm just quickly trying to whiz back through my mind. I think, in terms of production tanks, I think the the Soviet forty five millimeter was the biggest gun used on that. However, the Soviets also um, used the T26 as a gun platform 
for an artillery piece. And that right. featured, I think, what was that, the SU-5 or SU-26? One of the two, or possibly both. And I think that ended up using a 76 millimeter artillery piece. So okay. in terms of tanks, I think it's just the 45 millimeter gun. But if you're thinking of the chassis being used, as far as I can recall, it was the 76 millimeter that the Soviets used. Okay, thanks. So Peter, Peter O'Connor has asked a question, which again, I think will be tough to answer. But um, given its influence on tank development in other countries, if Britain had reconsidered adopting the Vickers Model E, what might the evolution have brought us? I mean, what if they had started putting that into production for themselves, where might that have gone? You know, you, you talked about the Matilda having some yeah. shared features there. I mean, it, it, is there anything you can kind of say with that? Or is it all just kind of conjecture and... and no, uh, I, 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 I think there is something we can add to that, is that um, we're talking medium tanks. And had the British turned around and said, yes, it looks a bit puny, looks a bit small, but we take what you say, Mr. Vickers. Yeah, we'll, we'll give it a try and we'll use this. So they would have ended up using it as a medium tank. Um, the strategy, or you know, the, the doctrine at the time for the British was to use medium tanks and light tanks. Mm. Until the British see a demonstration of the Soviet fast tanks, the Christie tanks, the BU, uh, sorry, the um, BT2 in Moscow in 1932, they come back all enthused about these new fast tanks. They want fast tanks. And that's when they decide that they're going to get rid of the medium effectively and use cruiser tanks. So, yes, they the, conceivably, you, you could say that the British would have used the, the medium tanks. But at the end of the day, they would have used the marquee right up until the point that they replaced that with the cruiser tanks at the end oh, of okay. the 1930s. Thank you. And we've got another, this is a comment really rather than a question from Hosen and Fury is saying there's an anecdote from the Finnish tankers that if the tank was shut down when the engine was hot, it wouldn't start anymore until it cooled down. Is that something you've heard of? That kind of echoes what the Poles um, criticise the tank for, that you could only run the tank for so long before there was insufficient cooling going on and the engine overheated. So that kind of echoes what the polls uh, believed so yeah i, I could quite uh, quite understand that so okay thank you and phil blood is saying i mean we've kind of covered this but not maybe it is there's is something else you can add did the vickers also sell the production systems and the design patents for these tanks so we talked about the actual exportation of models was there anything you know below that in terms of you know basically did they make any other cash in any other way well they they sold uh, production licenses to the poles and to the soviets um, I don't know the terms of those licenses, whether or not it was a lump sum payment um, with an agreed number of vehicles being produced or whether it was a, a per unit payment. If it was a per unit payment, then the Soviets would have owed Vickers quite a lot of money, um, I imagine. But I'm, I'm not familiar with those with those details. OK. And then Ian Carr is making the point that the designer is perhaps more important than the actual tank. Carden being killed in an air crash in thirty-five, and Lloyd falls out with Vickers. So is, you know, we we, we talk about a, you know, we talk about the era when individual designers were kind of famous. Around thinking of R.J. Mitchell and the Spitfire, things like that. You know, where that there's not that kind of designed by commute computer committee ways vehicles and things technologies designed these days. This was where. In some ways, the, the designers themselves were kind of superstars. I'm thinking about the, the, all the, um, the kind of 1930s um, magazines my, my grandfather had as a, as a, as a lad. Yeah, you know, they kind of they were tech was kind of a boy's hobby thing, like Meccano. And these designers would get profile pics like they would profile, I don't know, George Best or, 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 or um, you know, football player back in that yeah. day. So is, was that influential as well, the Vickers losing these two people? Yeah, I mean, Sir John Carden was was a very clever, visionary sort of man. Um, he came up with various other designs as well. I mean, some of the other later export tanks that Vickers started selling, uh, he was responsible for those. He was responsible for the um, suspension used on the British A9 and A10 tanks, which is later used on the Valentine. Um, had he not died in 35, I've no doubt that he would have been much more, you know, he would have been, continued to have been influential on British tank design mm. 
going forward. Okay, thank you. And one, one more comment, quick stroke question. Would the Italian Semavente's SPGs be considered as six-ton derivatives? That's a very good question. If you accept that the Italian medium tanks, the, the, the M13 series, M14, M15, are in fact derivatives of the six-tonner, then yes, the Semavente exactly would have been mm. the same because of Effectively, you're just taking the turret off, modifying the suspension, and putting the gun in there. So, mm -hmm. arguably, arguably, yes. Okay. Thank you. My last kind of question is is really for you, Pete. As you know, you're studying this era in that, and I, th I know what you're going to say. In a sense, is that this interwar period is often kind of dismissed by everybody because the tanks look clunky and they're not very fast, and they and we we think of those incredible models that went into such production numbers across the nations when you get to sort of 43, 44, 45, but the interwar period is actually, as you're making clear, far more interesting than perhaps we give it credit for, for the way, as we said, this evolutionary process where designs are being taken forward. And in order to know what to build, you've kind of got to know what has come before and what doesn't work and what, what can be upgraded and what can be improved upon. So so we, we should be perhaps looking at this period a bit more. I can't argue with that at all. That's good. I, no, I can no, only nod no. in a complete agreement. No, it's 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 because I mean I I have to say I'm one of those people when I get a tank book I kind of sometimes have a tendency to flick through the early pages I want to get to the kind of the the the, the proper fighting yeah. tanks that interest me and now now you're making me realize that these these earlier models are are, are, are more important it's not just that, that that they are they're they're interesting they are actually important as well yeah as you, as you say it's it's the word evolution these tanks form the early part of some of these evolutionary trees that you, you know you're, you're talking about here so yeah um they may not look as sexy as some of something produced in 1943-44 um certainly not produced in the same sort of numbers but in terms of importance they you know you can't ignore them no that's i think that's that's my takeaway from this so well pete we will bring things to an end and we'll just think of any reason to bring you back again uh, in the future to, to talk about another um i was going to say obscure but that's that's slicing these vehicles another lesser known um f uh, model uh, or you can just come on and do something on one of the classics you can come on and do something on the t34 or the sherman but you'd probably find that very boring you prefer your niche <laughs> subjects of these the, these inferential models <laughs> no that's great i'll i'll be uh, more than happy to come back Brilliant. Well, okay, folks, so that was two shows today. We're back in tomorrow with James Zobel talking about the POW experience in the Philippines. And then Wednesday, the show is very early in the day or late in the day, depending on where you are at 7 a.m. UK time, or that will be late in the evening in the US. And that's when we're le learning about the Philippines. We're looking at the um, the collaboration aspect, the, the, the people that were there working for the Japanese as opposed to against it. So that's Wednesday and tomorrow is James Zobel. So thanks, Pete. Thanks, viewers. I will see you all again tomorrow. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Good night.